Tonight, as much as anything, I want to simply bring you a message of encouragement because the Bible tells us that the closer we get to Jesus' return, we're supposed to keep encouraging one another, not just about the things that are going on in our lives right now, but about what lies ahead for us beyond this life because that's our ultimate source of hope. And while we need to carry on God's work uh, here on earth, we need to do so with an eye on eternity. That's what I want to talk about tonight. So take your Bibles if you have them. I hope you do. And turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to get there in just a bit. So hold the place there. This is a message that, um, honestly, I don't think you hear a lot in churches today. And I don't say that to reminisce about the past or the good old days. Because obviously I'm still a young contemporary guy, am, am I not? All right, don't let the beard fool you. It's, it's days are numbered here. But if we're not careful, we can lose sight of something that we should always keep in mind. We can talk about who we are as God's people. We're doing that in the series in the morning, and we can talk about things like how we can have uh, peace and joy and hope as we go through this life. But sometimes I think we forget that our ultimate peace and joy and rest are not to be found in this world. For that, we need to look beyond this life. And that's not always easy to do because uh, the prospect of thinking about death is usually not very pleasant, and that's what it takes to get from here to the other side. So perhaps the uh, story of uh, Fred's experience can help ease your mind about the transition that we'll all make one day from uh, this life to the next. And I don't have this firsthand, but uh, as the story goes, when Fred arrived at the pearly gates, the Line wasn't too long, so he didn't have to wait uh, for, for about a few minutes before his interview. But he was still kind of nervous about getting through the gate and into the heavenly city. And it didn't help when his turn came and he found himself face to face with a, uh, a very impressive uh, angelic being with a clipboard in hand. And the angel began to take down some of Fred's entry data. And after getting his name and address and a few other particulars, he said, Well, Fred, it would really help the process if you could share with me some experience, just, just one time when, when you performed a, a, a completely a, a selfless and kindly deed. And so Fred thought for a moment and said, I, I, think, I, have, I think I have something that, that might interest. He said, there was this time when I was walking along the street and, and I saw a lovely young lady there and it looked to me like she was being harassed by this, this uh, big, tough, rugged motorcycle gang uh, looking dude and and, and I tell you, when he, when he looked like he was starting to push around and get physical, that's when I took action. I went over, and the first thing I did was I kicked over his motorcycle just to distract his attention. Then I, then I hauled off and kicked him as hard as I could in the shins, and I, I told the lady to run for help. And then before he could react, I just hauled off and gave him a great shot right to the gut with my fist. Well, when Fred finished his story, the angel looked at him, and Fred wasn't a very imposing guy, so the angel said, well, that Fred, that's, that's quite the story. I've... I've got to admit, I'm, I'm pretty impressed. But could, could, you, could you tell me exactly when this happened? And Fred looked at his watch and said, oh, about two or three minutes ago. <laughs> now, when we finally reach the other side, I have a strong suspicion it's going to be nothing like Fred's experience. It's not going to be as ambiguous as an angel with a clipboard taking down our information and recording our good deeds because by the time we cross over, either by death or the rapture of the church, our eternal destiny will have already been determined with certainty by what we did or did not do in this life. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, works and efforts uh, of our own because that's not what saves us. Only by God's grace and a personal relationship with God uh, do we gain entry into heaven. But the Bible is clear that we will be judged and rewarded according to the things that we did in this life and how we responded to the opportunity that God gives us. You see, how we regard our time on earth is going to determine our readiness for eternity. And the choice a person makes in this lifetime will determine whether he or she will spend eternity in the presence of Christ or forever separated from Him. The Bible describes life as a vapor, something that disappears momentarily, then wisps away into thin air. In other words, life is like a fleeting moment in the scope of all eternity, and yet our reward and place of residence forever and ever is going to be determined by what takes place here on earth. So I want us to look at 1 Peter chapter 2. I want to begin reading in verse 
number 9 of 1 Peter chapter 2 and see what this tells us about all of this. And the Bible says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you would not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, I want you to notice back in verse number 11 there that talks about being aliens and strangers. What does that mean to be aliens and strangers in the world? And no, it's not something that uh, crawled out from the wreckage of Roswell, New Mexico. It's not something that's kept at Edwards Air Force in Area 51 under top uh, secret quarantine. I'm not talking about ETs or UFOs, but when the Bible talks about us as being aliens and strangers, it's trying to give us a perspective that we need to hold as we spend our time on earth. And for a little more insight, I want us to look at another passage in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is a familiar passage of Scripture, often referred to as the Hall of Faith. And it's a list of godly heroes who uh, demonstrated extraordinary faith during their lifetime, the trust of God for great things. And some of them are the main characters in very well-known Bible stories, uh, Noah and Abraham, Joseph, uh, Moses, David, and the like. And, and some are a little more obscure so far as they're mentioned in Scripture. People like uh, Enoch and, and Rahab and Jephthah. But all of them are described in this passage as a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on to trust God like they did. And I want to pick up in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse number 13. And it says that all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on the earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. But instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, it may not seem like we have a, a lot in common with the cast of characters that's mentioned uh, in this passage, but the Bible tells us that our lives can be marked by the same significance as theirs if we hold the same perspective that they did. As we, if we look at our lives as people just passing through who are looking for a home, as the Bible says, in another country and in another world. Jesus told his followers in John chapter 1 that they aren't of the world any more than he was of the world. C.S. Lewis is quoted as saying, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this life can satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that there's something in you, a deep desire that just can't be satisfied by anything this life offers? Well, that's because you were created for more. Even people who don't believe in God uh, are confronted with, 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 with desires and, and feelings and, and, and realities that they can't explain by, by any answer or anything that this life offers. And that's because each person, you've heard it said, we're, we're created with that God-shaped void that only He can fill. The issue is, is that we who have that relationship with Christ need to live in a way that shows the world that we have what they're looking for, that we have what they're missing, that we found it. Well, that's more likely to be the case. We're more likely to live with that kind of distinction if our focus is less on temporary concerns and more on eternal values. So that's what I want to focus on with the few moments that we have tonight. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come together tonight. Lord, to consider not just what's going on in our lives right now and how you can help us with those things, not just how we can be about your work and, and reach other people, but someday they can go to heaven with us, which is the vision of this church. That's what we want to be our focus. God, tonight, turn our attention to eternity. Put our minds and focus them on something that we walk out of here with thinking about. Lord, that just uh, uh, permeates our thoughts as we go through our days. Lord, that we know that there's something beyond all of this, something greater than all of it that awaits us in eternity. And Lord, let that spark us to do more than we ever imagined, uh, than we ever dreamed that we could and would do for you as your spirit empowers us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I want to briefly consider with you five characteristics, and uh, they're really attitudes that should uh, distinguish Christ's followers as they journey through this life. Five traits that as aliens and strangers in this world that we must possess in this life in order to prepare for the next life. And the first one is simply this. As aliens and strangers in the world, we must rely on outside guidance. I could say it this way. We need to rely on something other than ourselves for guidance and direction. Now, uh, be honest with me. How many of you have trouble following directions? How many of you ha have trouble uh, uh, asking for directions? Or maybe both, All right? Uh, ladies, your husbands, dire directionally challenged in any way here? Or, or maybe it's just that they're so uh, mechanically inclined, they can just look at a pile of parts and they automatically know how everything goes together. You know, who needs uh, instruction manuals and diagrams? That's just part of the packaging and, and, and you toss that. Or, or maybe it's that, uh, that we men just have this uh, innate sense of direction and we always know just where we're going. We don't always know how to get there, but we know where we're going. And with GPS and Google Maps and all that, nobody even needs to know that anymore, so we're, we're all good with that. But as aliens and strangers in the world, as the Bible describes, you've got to rely on something other than yourself for guidance and instruction. It's like if you're a tourist in a place where you're not really familiar with the customs and, and, and the locations and the landmarks and, and you don't speak the language, so you have to rely on, on someone or something outside of yourself for directions. It's, it's, it's like that tour guide who, who takes you, you get on the bus and, and you go there and they, you know, they uh, give you all kinds of insights that make your uh, trip a little more interesting and they might say something like, ladies and gentlemen, if you would turn there to your left, you're going to see a unique blend of uh, urban art and architecture. Uh, no lady or other left. You're looking at a parking garage, graffiti covered parking ramp. And other times they may something something that's a little bit restrictive. All right, like stand back and stay behind the yellow line until the train comes to a complete stop and the doors open. Okay, otherwise you're going to end up greasing the tracks. It's for your own good, but it's a restriction. But the tour guide gives things like that. Now. As an alien and a stranger, we need uh, a little more than a typical tour guide to get us through life, don't we? But as followers of Christ, as aliens and strangers in the world, who do we follow? Who do we look to? Who do we listen to? I want to ask you this. Does it do any good to rely on someone who doesn't know any more than you or I do about life? That's what some believers do when they entrust their, and take their cues from people and places that are really clueless about our purpose and our destination. So who or what do we rely on for direction? Well, how about the one Jesus sent after he left the earth, the one he promised would be with us and in us, the counselor, the word calls him that, the one whose role is to remind us what Jesus said and to guide us into all truth. And by the way, this is truth. This is our guidebook. This is our instruction manual. And life is too complex to try to navigate things without it. But I'm going to tell you this, and you're going to see it more and more in the days ahead. There are all kinds of people calling into question the authority uh, and the authenticity of what's in this book. You're hearing it with some of our prominent church leaders who are beginning to ask those same questions. And I have to look at that and say, is it any wonder we see problems all over the place, including in the church? Because the world has ditched the instruction manual a long time ago. And as aliens and strangers, we need to rely on that. We need to rely on our guide and instructions that the Holy Spirit gives us. But as much as we know that we need to rely on God's Word and the Holy Spirit, it's not always easy to trust things that we can't see, especially when the Spirit uh, guides us and leads us into situations uh, that are often foreign to us. But as aliens and strangers, who can we trust more than our Creator? Who knows us better? Who knows who we are and, and, and where we are and where we're going and where we need to go? And not only does he know everything we need in every situation, he has the power to provide it. The irony in all that is that often we shun the Spirit's guidance and we end up relying on worldly sources for direction about where to go and, and what to do and what to eat and what to wear and what to like and a lot of times even how we should think or feel. But what does the world know about what we really need? So why do we look at worldly sources for our direction. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28 says, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. 
But that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, and is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, if you're pursuing God and his purposes, he'll take care of the rest. We don't have to worry about it. And he's never going to steer us wrong as we journey through this life as aliens and strangers in the world. Look, Jesus understands what we're going through. He's been there. He knows what it's like to be an outsider. He knows what it's like to be rejected by the very people he came to save. I think sometimes we get the notion that, that we really can't uh, relate to Jesus or he to us because, you know, he's God. And obviously that, you know, that gave him a perspective and an advantage that we don't have. But even though Jesus was fully God and becoming human and becoming a man, he put aside those divine prerogatives and lived within the same constraints we do. And his supernatural power and insight came from the same source and opportunity we have by relying on his Father and on the Holy Spirit. And the power and guidance that he got in that way is available to us as we rely on the same Spirit, the Bible says, that raised Jesus from the dead. And that means that our hope of heaven and hope of eternity with him is as sure as Christ's resurrection. That's the assurance that the Holy Spirit gives us. The Bible calls it a deposit. It said Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, as, as an assurance, as a guarantee of what's to come. And, and the Bible refers to him as the comforter or the paraclete, uh, which means one who comes alongside of us and lives within us. So wherever we're going, whatever we do, however we're journeying through this life as aliens and strangers, we don't go it alone because his spirit is always with us. So the first thing we need to do as an alien and stranger is rely on that outside guidance, God's word, and the Holy Spirit for our direction. The second thing we need to keep in mind as an alien and stranger is that we need to expect misunderstanding. Okay, don't expect to understand everything in this life or don't expect to be understood in every situation. The fact is, between us and the world, there's gonna be a lot of misunderstanding. I remember one time when I was in the, uh, the former Soviet Union, I was on a mission trip and I was trying to communicate and thought I was doing a pretty good job and I'd even learned some of the language and, and, and I was carrying on and, and all of a sudden this little kid tugs at the, 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 the jacket of my interpreter and he says something to him. I said, what did he say? He said, you talk funny. Now, he wasn't rude. He was just telling it like it is. That's a reality that's going to face anyone uh, who's trying to communicate in a foreign land or an unfamiliar language. At some point, you're going to be greatly misunderstood. And as aliens and strangers in this world, we're not only going to be misunderstood, we're going to be mischaracterized. We're going to be mistreated, just as Jesus was. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you're blessed, for the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal or as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Listen, people rejected Christ, they're going to reject those who follow him. Don't be surprised by it. Don't get bent out of shape for it. by it. This world is going to be a harsh and a hostile place for followers of God. I don't know about you, but I like to uh, keep up with current events. And as frustrating as that can be in, in uh, today's political and social environment, I find that if I'm not careful, it's a lot easier for me to get ticked off by what I see in here than it is to feel Christ's compassion for those that have been blinded by the God of this world who wants to destroy all of us. And the ways that he usually goes about that, what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, is through lies and through what we're talking about now, through misunderstanding. Years ago, when I was a feisty youth pastor, I read an article about a, a, a peaceful pro-life demonstration that happened right down the road from here. And I realized that a lot of times believers can do things that bring more negative attention on than positive, but that wasn't the case here. I had actually been there. But when I picked up this article, I noticed that the reporter described the, the, the event in a way that completely mischaracterized the people and the cause. 
So I took out a pen and paper, no, I, no iPad back then, and I fired off a letter to the editor, and I had that ready to go when one of our board members walked into my office, and he could tell I was kind of rattled. So he said, well, what's up? And, and I told him my intentions, and he challenged me by asking, why are you surprised by that? Isn't that really what we should expect? And the fact is, he was right. I mean, listen, the Bible is a lot more stern with God's people who dabble in sin than it is with ungodly people who are just being themselves. Sinners are going to be sinners. Don't expect the world to go out of its way to accommodate godly people. We're going to be treated unfairly. Our beliefs are going to be misrepresented. Our way of life is going to be marginalized. We are going to uh, find that our stand for truth is still going to be labeled as intolerance. And, 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 and our, uh, our, our constant stand for truth is, is not going to be something the world understands. And we don't go along with their views. We don't go with the flow of popular culture. They're not going to accept us. Some time ago, I picked up a City View paper, the magazine that's in a lot of the, the lobbies of the businesses around town. And in that particular issue, there was a political editorial by uh, a former professor from one of our local universities. Happens to be the college my daughter attends. And in there, he described evangelical Christians as a mob and a menace to society. That's a lot of how a lot of supposedly enlightened people view us. And I can tell you this, we can... We can try to dispel that notion. We can do our best to, to try not to live up to that opinion. But there is always going to be a crowd that sees nothing but the distorted caricature that the culture has drawn of us. We can be gracious in the face of opposition. Uh, we can do everything right, and we're still going to endure misunderstanding and rejection. But that's the same way they treated the prophets. That's the same way they treated heroes of faith throughout the ages. So don't be alarmed. When ungodly agendas dominate the, the cultural landscape and they make their way into every facet of society because that's the way the world is going to continue to trend until the very end. You know, throughout history and even to this day, there's been kind of a skewed theology that says that somehow if we just keep changing and adapting to the culture, then eventually we're going to gain prominence in the political and societal arena, and, and, and that's how we're going to transform the culture, and, and Jesus can come back then and, and reign over a new world order of, uh, of great prosperity. But the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says in the end times it's going to be even more treacherous for Christ's followers. It says that we're never going to be the majority. And while we need to get involved in issues and take a stand for truth and, and try to make peace along the way, uh, we're still going to be unjustly labeled with hate and intolerance. And yet the Bible told us to rejoice through all that because we're getting the opportunity to participate in Christ's sufferings. And no matter what happens, Romans 8, 18 tells us this. It says the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So as aliens and strangers in the world, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit and God's word for guidance. We need to expect to be misunderstood. And the third thing is this. As aliens and strangers, we need to be extra cautious and alert. For one thing, we don't want to give, uh, add to those world's misconceptions of us. But we're still going to be mischaracterized. We're still going to be, uh, false assumptions are going to be made about us. But we need to live in a way that doesn't confirm those assumptions. Again, think of yourself like that tourist in another country. What, what kind of reputation do you want to avoid? I've done a lot of mission trips with students over the years and always had to emphasize before we went there how people around the world tended to view us. Like, uh, we're very privileged. Um, a lot of times they see us as arrogant, obnoxious, especially some of the younger people and the way they can carry on if we're not careful. So we needed to em emphasize uh, that we need to be careful not to lend credence to their opinions. In other words, we need to behave ourselves, all right? We need to be extra courteous and extra gracious at all times. And as aliens and strangers in the world, all of us need to take that posture. Because, you know, as much as I uh, can grieve over the, the, the blatant disregard for God and his people that I often see in the world, I can get more agitated by people who claim to follow Christ but behave in ways that bring more reproach on the kingdom than anything the world does. We already read in 1 Peter chapter 2, which says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires, which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. They may not honor him now, but the Bible tells us that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess 
that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God and Father. They may not accept him, they may not accept us, but it's not the world's acceptance or approval that we're after. First cha- uh, Peter chapter 1, 17 says, Since you call on a father who judges each man's works impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. And that's why we don't follow the world's routines. That's why we don't participate in everything that the world says is acceptable. Because we follow a different path. We follow the one where Jesus goes ahead of us and his spirit lights the way. You know, as agents of God in this culture, we do need to engage the culture, but never should we imitate it. And while we should conduct ourselves as good citizens with honor and respect and integrity, We need to keep in mind that our true citizenship is not of this world because we're just passing through. This is not our ultimate destination. That brings me to the fourth trait of God's people as aliens and strangers in this world. And that is the fact that they never quite feel at home. As alien and stranger in this world, you never quite feel at home. How many of you like to travel? I do. I love to travel. I like to be home. I like to move all my stuff all over, but I like to travel. But you know... No matter how much I enjoy my time away, no matter how much adventure I had, how refreshed I am, isn't it always nice to come back home? I always like to come home. It's always refreshing to be there. And as aliens and strangers in the world, we need to look and realize that this world is not our home. You know, we don't have to settle for a mundane life down here. Serving Christ should be full of adventure. It should be full of life and invigoration. But we need to keep in mind that even though our lives can be marked by that type of passion and challenge, as God's people, as aliens and strangers, this world is not our home, and it never will be. As we read in first, uh, as Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16, those heroes of faith were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. That's why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Folks, no matter what joys and adventures... No matter what trials or difficulties face you in this life, something far better awaits us. If you want to settle in down here, that's up to you. But the Bible tells me in Philippians chapter 3, 20, that my citizenship is in heaven. This world is not my home. I think too many believers, they put their roots down here, and they get uh, too attached to this, this temporary terrain. And while God wants us to be content, He wants us to be satisfied with the things that He gives us. Uh, He doesn't guarantee our comforts. And He's not pleased when we let complacency settle in. So if that's the way we live, we're never going to find satisfaction in this life. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying what God gives us. We of all people should should have a joy and, 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 and something that shows, that's evident to everyone around us, that we've got something that they're looking for. But this world is not our home. And as we regard ourselves as aliens and strangers in this world, we will be keenly aware of the fact that we're just passing through. I illustrate this with a true story from the 19th century, and there was an American tourist who paid a visit to a uh, a renowned Polish rabbi called Hafez Haim. And the tourist uh, uh, came to visit him, and he came into his dwelling there, and he was kind of surprised just to see that that his home was just a a simple room, basically filled with books, and, and then there was a table and a cot to sleep on. And he said to the rabbi, he said, where, where, where is your furniture? And the rabbi replied, well, where is yours? And the tourist was kind of taken aback a little bit because, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just a tour. I'm just passing. I'm just visiting. And the rabbi said, so am I. Because, you see, if you regard yourself as an alien and stranger in this world, you'll never quite feel at home in this life. And that brings me to the final characteristic I want to consider as we close And this is the trait that really needs to pervade everything else that we consider. It's the attitude that has characterized Christ's most committed followers through the centuries, and it's simply this. As aliens and strangers in the world, we should have another place and other things in our minds. The fact is, if we've decided to follow Jesus, don't expect to be satisfied and fulfilled by anything in this world. Because if we are, something is wrong. If our interests mirror those of the world around us, there's a good chance that our priorities and our passions and our perspectives are out of whack. Yeah, be content with what God has given you and where he's placed you, but don't put your stock in what you can get out of this life. 1 Peter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God, our Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance 
that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Over and over, you're going to see the Scriptures challenge us to live with a perspective that isn't centered on this present life, but what's in store for us on the other side. Because you focus on what this life offers, even the best stuff it offers, you're going to be disappointed. All we have to do is look at those who are the most successful and, and, and the most accomplished in the eyes of the world. And some of them are the most miserable and malcontent among us. You look at celebrities. You look at athletes and entertainers and world leaders. And even they'll tell you that things don't satisfy. I listened to an interview the other day with one of the top quarterbacks in the NFL. And after they had just won the Super Bowl, he said he's riding the bus afterwards. And he says to himself, he thinks to himself, is this all there is? Another interview with the guy they considered the greatest of all time. The greatest of all time. They were interviewing him, and, and, and they said, "said Do you think there's there, there's more beyond this?" And he said, "I hope so, because I know that even those ultimate achievements don't satisfy." Perhaps you've heard the old adage that some Christians are too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Have you heard that one before? Honestly, I don't uh, really think that's the problem that most believers have today. I dare say if we went through life with a more intense awareness of the joys that await us on the other side and the horrors that await those who don't know Christ, I think we'd be a lot more diligent about fulfilling His purpose and reaching others for His kingdom. A lot of people, they spend their entire lives laboring and investing, pursuing and spending on things that will be gone in an instant. But as followers of Christ, we need to keep our mind on what He told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so I ask you tonight, where is your treasure? Can it be found anywhere on earth? Can it be found in your home? In your garage, in your closet, your bank account. Maybe we can just look at the things that get the bulk of our attention because that's usually a pretty good indication of where our treasure is. But if we consider ourselves aliens and strangers in this world, our treasure is going to be somewhere where we can't see it now, but it's waiting for us on the other side. You see, you don't have to be a famous hero of faith to have a proper perspective in life because. I'm sure that one day when we stand before God and the books are open, that there will be a lot of unsung heroes who serve behind the scenes who have the greatest rewards in heaven because they went through life with the proper perspective. And they regarded themselves as aliens and strangers. And because of that, they made the most of every opportunity on earth. You know, I think a lot of people have largely ceased to be as effective as they could in this life because they stopped thinking about the next life. I want to close with a story about a faithful missionary who spent his life serving Christ in another land. And yet I think his experience is something that really applies to, to really all true servants of God. Years ago, this missionary was returning home from the U.S. after several terms on the field. And he was traveling a, aboard a ship bound for New York Harbor. And he got into a conversation along the way with an atheist. And this atheist kind of challenged the missionary by pointing out the futility of spending one's life in, in service like he did. And he noted the fact that no one on board the ship was even paying attention to the missionary, and he kind of took that as a sign that nobody really cared. It really didn't matter to anybody. And the servant of God replied, well, I'm, I'm not really home yet. Well, the atheists assumed he was talking about when they got into the dock and that there would be some crowd waiting for him and met the ship when it was there. And again, the atheists scoffed when they disembarked and there wasn't a solitary person there to welcome the missionary. And once again, he said, well, I'm not home yet. Well, they parted company, and it was a lonely train ride that awaited the missionary from New York to a small Midwestern hometown. And when he reached his destination, he finally came to the point where he couldn't hold the tears back because, once again, he got off the train, and there was nobody there. And he thought to himself, maybe, maybe the atheist was right. Maybe what I've spent my life on really doesn't matter. Maybe it didn't make much of a difference at all. In that moment, the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit spoke to his mind and said, you're not home yet. You're not home yet. So I encourage you today, don't lose heart, don't lose hope, and don't settle in down here 
But with great joy, with great anticipation, keep your eyes on eternity because you're not home yet. Would you bow your heads with me as we close? If you're here tonight, I want to give you a chance to respond to this word in, in several different ways because maybe a, a different aspect of, of the message spoke to you. Maybe as you're going through this life, you realize that you need direction. We all do, but maybe you're at a particular point where you just need a special direction from God. And maybe you've been trying to kind of make your own way. Maybe you've been looking to other sources, relying on other things for that direction, or maybe not. Maybe you're just at a point now where it's just painfully obvious you need something beyond yourself, and you say, God, you know the situation. I don't even have to tell you about it, but it's there. I need your direction. And so tonight, you have a, a very strong awareness of the fact that you need something outside of yourself for that guidance and direction. And with the other heads bowed, if, you're, if that's you tonight, and, and that's what you really need from him, as an alien and stranger going through this life, you just need a, a, a special bit of God's direction. I want you to stand right where you're at. We're going to pray in just a few moments for people uh, in, in several things. But if that's you tonight, and you just need special direction from God, you might not be relying on the wrong thing. You just need that direction. If that's you tonight, and say, God, I, I need that from you. Would you stand? And we're going to pray for you in just a few moments. Yeah. And now if there are others of you here who you look around and you see the mistreatment in the, going on in the world and maybe like me you get frustrated by it and it's easier to, to lack compassion for what you see and, and, and maybe you've even been the brunt of it. And that misunderstanding has been directed a lot. Maybe at work you're, you're experiencing that. Maybe you're just frustrated in general when you look at the news and it carries on and you find yourself struggling to have that compassion for people who are misled even more than, than, than he might try to do to us at times. And that's you. And you say, you know what? I need, I need special, I need a touch of God just to, because I'm being mistreated, I'm being mischaracterized, or maybe I just need to have a better attitude about those who are trying to do that to me. And that's you tonight. And you've experienced that. I want you to stand. We're going to pray for you in just a second along with these. Thank you, Jesus. And maybe tonight you're in the category where you, You've been living a little bit off the cuff, and you say, you know what? I may need to proceed with a little more caution. I may be just kind of shooting from the hip in life, and maybe at times I haven't set the best example as maybe I could. Maybe I've even got myself into some situation because I haven't proceeded through this life like it is a treacherous place at times because it will be if we're not careful. I need to rely on the Holy Spirit, and I, and I need to take that caution. I need, to, I need to look to Him for where I'm going, and I, and I need to be more cautious and alert in this life. And if that's you tonight, and you say, I just need God to help me in that area, I want you to stand and join these. We're going to pray for you as well in just a second. And then maybe you're in the category where you just feel, you know, I'm putting my roots down here, and we got to be responsible in life. we got to make our way. we got to provide for our family. we got to do all those things, but... Maybe your focus just hasn't been on the eternal things as much as it needs to. And maybe you've been overwhelmed lately by the issues of life. Maybe you're going through something physical, financial, just something that, that's pervasive in your thinking. And it, it's kind of pushed back the thoughts of the fact that this life is not all there is. And, and you just need a better glimpse of eternity. And, and you need to get to the place where you just realize this isn't your home. Maybe I'm feeling too much like this is where I've got to make it. And you know what? I don't. I need to focus on eternity, and that's you tonight. Would you stand and join these, and we're going to pray for you. And finally, you may just see, say to yourself, you know what? I want to have another place and other things on my mind because I have been a little more occupied, preoccupied with the things of this life, and tonight, just hearing this simple message, you realize, you know what? I need to turn my attention and my focus to other things. And as an alien and stranger, I want other things to occupy my thoughts. I want other things to occupy my actions. And you just want to be a person who has other place, another place and other things on your mind. And if you want prayer for that, I want you to stand and join these who are already here. And I'm going to pray for everybody together in just a second. Lord, I thank you for those in this place tonight. Lord, who realize that uh, you call us to be aliens and strangers in this world. Not that we stand out, not that we're trying to be literally be strange, not that we try to put ourselves at odds with others because you tell us to make peace however we can. But Lord Jesus, you told us that we would be aliens and strangers in this life and we need to regard ourselves as such as much as anything because we need to put our focus on the fact that our home is not here. 
And Lord, for those tonight who may be standing and they just need special guidance, maybe they have and maybe they haven't been looking to other sources, that doesn't matter, but tonight they, they know they need to look to you. They need something outside of themselves. They're done trying to figure it out in their own strength. God, give them a special wisdom and insight. Lord, illuminate the way before them by your spirit that they would see more clearly than ever before. Give that guidance and direction that they know as an alien and stranger in this life comes from you. And Lord, for those who may be struggling with the misunderstanding that comes our way in life, maybe they've been the brunt of it at work or, or from a, a neighbor, or from maybe even a family member. Lord, or maybe they just look around and they see everybody at odds with one another and it's just easy to get fed up with all of it. It's easier to get frustrated with those who seem to be in opposition to us and, and they just need a special grace, Lord, tonight to either endure that opposition or maybe a compassion for those who are putting forth that opposition. God, grant it to them tonight. And Lord, for those who need to proceed through life with, with maybe a little more caution, not, not hesitancy, not apprehension, but God, just, just being cautious because the enemy who's about to, to, to destroy us in many ways and things will come at us through, through very subtle and unexpected means, they just need to be alert. God, give them a, a spiritual insight, a spiritual alertness. Lord, something that, that looks and sees and understands and comprehends what's going on. Lord, that they don't have to be afraid of it. But God, they proceed, Lord, looking to your thing, not looking to the things of the world, not dabbling in, in things that are even questionable, not seeing how close they can get to the edge without toppling over, but God, running in the direction that you want us to go, seeking and pursuing your purposes. And God, for those who just want to come to the point where they just don't feel as at home down here, not that they're discontent, Lord, but they just, they just don't want to be satisfied. They don't want to be satisfied by anything but you. God, they wanted to sit at your feet. They want to drink from your word. They want to spend time in your presence and find that that's the only thing that really satisfies. God, give that them that longing for something beyond this life, something that can never be satisfied in our time on earth. And Lord, I pray for all of us that you would turn our attention to things beyond this realm. That God, as we go through this life, that we would find contentment, that we would find peace, that we would find fulfillment in doing your purpose, but we would always do so realizing that this world is not our home. This is not our ultimate destination. God, I pray for those who are going through hurts and pains, Lord, that I can't explain and maybe you're not going to leave them on this side of eternity. God, I pray that somehow that focus, that they're, they're home, they aren't home yet. This isn't all there is. This is such a fleeting moment in the scope of eternity, God. Give them a hope and a joy that pervades anything that could come their way in this life. We ask it in Jesus' name. Now I want to ask everybody in this place to stand, and I have one more appeal that I want to make. And then these altars are going to be open. I encourage you just to spend a few moments here. You might find a place where you're at. There's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes just stepping out, coming to this altar that represents that place of encounter with God and just sealing that commitment with Him and just maybe spending a few moments just pondering eternity and what lays ahead. But maybe there are those of here tonight who you don't have a home in heaven because you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, which is the only thing that's going to get you there. You're not going to get there by being a good person. And I get there by anything you're going to do in your own efforts. The Bible says that we've all sinned. Sin is simply going your own way. Not hard for me to believe that my own way is not the same as a perfect God's way. In fact, that sin is in such opposition to God that it requires the most extreme penalty, and that's death. Eternal separation from God. That's really the essence of death. And the Bible says that it's pretty simple, though, to remedy that because Jesus came. He died in our place. He took what we deserved. And when he laid down his life as a sacrifice for our sins, all that we need to do is acknowledge that for ourselves and say, Jesus, I want to give you my old life in exchange for you new. I want you to take control. I want you to be the, my Lord and my Savior. And I want to start following your ways in this life. And you've never done that. So you're not on your way to heaven. You can turn on a dime tonight and begin to go the other way. And your destination and your eternal home and, and your reward will be set. But you need to make that decision and acknowledge to Jesus tonight that you've gone your own way in sin. And if you're willing to do that and to give him control of your life, he'll come in and take control. He'll forgive you your sin and he'll give you an eternal home in heaven. So if that's you this morning with the other head bowed, I want, I want you to just look up and catch my eye if that's you this morning or, or this evening and you're saying, I need to make that decision. Maybe you're doing it for the first time, and maybe you've just been away from God, and you've been going your own way, and you need to get back to it. If that's you tonight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scan this place just back and forth once or twice. I want you to look up and catch my eye, because I want to pray for you as we close. Is anybody here tonight who's looking for that, okay? Anybody else? Yeah. 
look across one more time. I see some younger people. That's the time to make that commitment. God's got a purpose for you the time you're young. He spared you a lot of things. Life won't be easy, but there's nothing like serving God because that's your purpose. That's what you were made for. Lord Jesus, I pray for those who just acknowledge that they need to make that commitment to you tonight. Lord, right now in this moment, they don't have to repeat wor words after me. They don't have to have any profound prayer, but just in these moments as they're acknowledging before you that they've gone their own way and sinned against you. Jesus, they're acknowledging that you are the Son of God who came and died in their place and rose again with the power and authority to give them new life. And Lord, in this moment, they're exchanging their old life for your new life. They're saying, God, forgive me. Come in and take control. Thank you for being my Savior. And I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be in control of my life. And from this moment on, they're going to begin to look to you for direction. They're going to begin to look for you for guidance. They're going to begin to look at the world through the way that you look at it. And they're also going to realize they don't have to settle in down here because their eternal home, their reward is in heaven. Lord, I thank you for saving them. Lord, for bringing people into your kingdom tonight. If you made that decision tonight, I want to encourage you to find one of the pastors here. Just tell them that you made that commitment. There's some materials out for you in the fore you can find at the information desk that will, that will give you some insight on how to proceed. You need to tie into a good church, and if you haven't, ha don't have one, this is the place to be because you're going to hear the word, get a Bible. We've got some things out there. If you don't have them, start looking in there. Start seeing what Jesus says to you through his word. Look in the New Testament. The Gospel of John or the Gospel of Mark is a great place to start. But I just want to encourage you for the next few moments, just find a place of prayer. It may just be for a, for a couple of minutes just to let God seal some things in your thinking and turn your attention toward eternity. If you want to come down and find the place, the worship team will, will spend a few moments just ministering. But I encourage you to do that as we go tonight. But go with eternity on your mind and realize that we're not home yet.